we worship this morning according to the abbreviated service of the word on page 38 in the front of the hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Our epistle lesson this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 7 begins at verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So far the epistle lesson. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the 22nd chapter according to St. Luke and begins at verse 54. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the gospel of the Lord. We sing the next hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our Lenten series on the Beatitudes from the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. One spring night, you are out later than usual. You take the main streets to avoid any problems. Then you hear something. Up ahead, to the right, down an alley. As you get closer, you hear kind of a guttural groan, almost a wail. Do you check it out? Who knows what's down some dark alley in the shadows? Did somebody get mugged, hurt? Curiosity draws you in. You turn the corner, you walk a few feet into the alley. You see someone curled up, almost in a fetal position, crying, no, sobbing shoulders heaving up and down with grief. You're not sure what to do, what to say. Call the authorities. You see that the man is in grave straits. You gently put a hand on his shoulder. You say, is there something I can do for you? He seems inconsolable. What are you so sad about, you ask? Is there something I can do? Would you like to talk? You certainly wouldn't congratulate him. You wouldn't say how blessed you are to be out here in this alley, crying and mourning as though you just lost your best friend. No, you would think instead something like how unfortunate for this poor soul. Last week we began our Lenten series linking the litany of our Lord's Beatitudes to our Lord himself, to his sufferings, death, and resurrection. We listened in on Christ congratulating his believers who cannot help in some way but be faint reflections of the traits that we see in our Savior. Now whether you are in the crowds who are listening in or whether you are a disciple or a believer, these Beatitudes seem all upside down. Plainly Jesus, we noted, has a different take on who is blessed and who is not, who are the winners and who are the losers, who gets the blessed are you, and who does not. Before us is the second of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they 
will be comforted. Shakespeare's Juliet said to Romeo, parting is such sweet sorrow. Now English teachers would call that an oxymoron. It is a contradiction in terms. How can sorrow be sweet? And yet we have such contradictions in terms around us all the time, don't we? We talk about bittersweet moments or a deafening silence or an open secret or a tragic comedy. How can sorrow be sweet? What kind of sadness brings gladness? What kind of grief creates relief? Isn't such a thing actually impossible? And yet Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now if the congratulations of Christ himself rests upon the heads of those who mourn, if the Savior himself gives a handshake of divine consolation and congratulations to people who are grieving, well then, it must be so. Perhaps you have noticed this. Was there some time in your own life some pain or problem that actually became for you a path to blessings that you never could have even predicted? Have you talked to some old veteran of the cross, white-haired old lady perhaps, who talks about some deep sorrow in her life, some dark valley through which God led her, some unbearable burden, but even as she tells it, you sense some sort of deep joy and peace like a river in its well-worn channel. Perhaps you have experienced it yourself. Some sorrow in your life that caused you to run into the arms of God in a way that otherwise you would never have done. Blessed are those who mourn, says Jesus. Doesn't the Bible say rejoice in the Lord always and serve the Lord with gladness? Well, of course it does. But we must not be superficial here. There are things that we must mourn over. Sin in ourselves, within, the sin that is around us, the broken hearts and lives caused by sin in this world, this is the godly sorrow which works repentance, which Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. The Bible bids you and me, and we know this, we must take sin seriously. We just can't brush it off. Our sins drove the nails into the hands and the feet of Christ. It was sin that took everything that was beautiful in the beginning and made it ugly. It was our sin which caused God the Son to step onto this planet in order to deal with it. Real sorrow over sin. Christians get this because it is the one thing that equips us to truly appreciate the grace of God in Christ Jesus and His great pardon. The sorrow that you and I experience is natural enough. 
It is a lifelong battle. We do not always live on the same high plane of faith and love toward our Lord Jesus as we should. We fail often. And yet we go running back daily to the goodness and the grace and the forgiveness of the one who took upon himself our weaknesses and who has promised to lift from us our broken hearts. So there's this man crying in the alley. His shoulders shaking. His faith a waterfall of tears. You don't know what to say. You're not sure what you should ask. Against your better judgment, you sit down next to him. And you say once more, Would you like to talk? I will listen. And then, catching his breath between sobs, he actually starts to say something. He says, I did lose my best friend this evening. I could have prevented it. I could have done something. I could have said something. But I let him down. You say to the man, well, maybe you're being too hard on yourself. We all make mistakes. What is it that was so terrible? What happened? They came for my friend tonight, you know, to arrest him. Charges were bogus. I tried to stop them. Didn't work. Then I ran. So did the other guys. But I had to know what happened. It was getting later. I doubled back. One of the guys had connections. He at least got me onto the premises. So I waited. Tried to stay warm. Blend in with the crowd. Then some gal, she said, I was involved in all of this. I said, absolutely not. And then another. And then some other gal opens her big mouth once more, and I cussed up and down. I had never met this guy who was in trouble. I was lying. I think they knew. I heard that sound. My friend said it would go down like this. I, I heard that sound off in the distance. I looked up. There he was. My friend. He looked terrible. They had beaten him up. I didn't think they were allowed to do that. My friend looked at me. His eyes were so sad. He heard everything 
I had said, he looked at me like he still loved me. I lost it. I ran out the main gate, off the premises, down one dark street, then another, into this alley. Here I am. I can never go back again. It's all over. He will never take me back. I'll never see him again. There's no going back. He pauses. You say, what is your name? He looks up at you. Peter. No, that's the name my friend gave me. Peter. Rocky! Ah, some rock, huh? No. Uh, my mother called me Simon. Just Simon. That's my name. You pause for a moment. Your friend. Who is your friend? He's a teacher. No, no, he was the teacher. That's what we called him, the teacher, the master, the one and only. Jesus. I once called him the son of the living God. Wow. Tonight I said I never met him. I ran, I can never go back if I ever see him again. He won't want anything to do with me. You look at the poor man in the alley, you take off a coat and put it around his shoulders. You did see his name was Jesus? Yes. I know him. I have spent time with him. And what you did tonight, I've done that too. Thousand times over. Ran. Talk big talk. But then walked out on him. Tried not to talk too much about him. Did my friends. A little too embarrassed. Most of the guys I hung with, why? They never knew. Your friend and I used to spend a lot of time together. We were actually quite tight for a long time. But I ditched out on him. Like you, I too had faith in myself, I had faith in my faith. But I have spent my whole life running back to him. And every time I do, He smiles at me 
as though he's just tickled to see me again. Pulls up a chair, pours a glass, and talks to me as though I had never left. A thousand times I have gone back to him. And every time I see him, he tells me that this is why he showed up in the first place. To be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. My shame is your shame. Fisherman, I too left him and ran, but always I've spent my whole life running back to him. As you get the coat around the man's shoulders, you cut the chill. You know, morning is coming. You say, come on, let's go back together. Let's see how this whole thing turns out. His shame and pain and mourning and sorrow on him instead of us, our friend in our place. And then remember, remember what he said. Do you remember what he said? third day, the third day, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us offer up our prayers for Ray Horseman, who is hospitalized at Mayo in La Crosse, for Elmer Amborn, who is hospitalized at Gunderson in La Crosse, and for Barry Weirs in his illness. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants and restore their strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with them and bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we also pray, O Lord Jesus Christ, thou innocent Lamb of God, who before the Sanhedrin was falsely accused, beaten, and sentenced to death as a blasphemer and a deceiver of the people, we beseech thee, show us the salvation that is in thy merit, and look upon us in mercy, as thou didst look upon Peter, that sincerely repenting of our sin, we may obtain by faith the comfort of forgiveness, and at the end be found acceptable in thy sight, thou who hast taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
applied to the signed guest register. Please read each other.